Bill Haley Jr. How lovely to meet you. You too. How are you? Very good. How are you doing? I'm good. Where do we find you? I am, uh, in, well, probably Philadelphia would probably be the, the closest city. I'm about 40 miles west of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Very nice. Very mm -hmm. nice. Wow, have you got a story to tell, Bill Haley Jr.? I, I, and I'm looking forward to hearing all of it. So let's let's just step right back in time. Firstly, I know that you're one of ten kids that your dad had. Is that right? Uh, with three different three different three different women, three wives. Yes, three wives. And are you all friends and close? Actually, no, no. It's actually. Um... Uh, a very dysfunctional story, frankly, uh, you know, um, without going into too much detail about it, my, my father basically, um, um, my, mo my mother was his second wife, so he had two children with his first wife, right. and he was separated from his first wife when he met my mother, <clears throat> and my mother got pregnant, so his first wife agreed to a divorce, and he had actually five children with my mother, but 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 uh, the second child died uh, of a, of SIDS. They call it sudden in, yeah, in yeah. death syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, then um, leaving a lot out here, but basically around 1962, when when my father's fame had begun to wane in the United States, and he was always away from home anyway, traveling all those years, um, he moved to Mexico and basically abandoned our family. There's no there's no you know, nice way to put it, um, and, and didn't stay in touch, and frankly discouraged any contact between the family. So he did remarry in Mexico and had three children there. Um, so we're, we don't, no, we're not in contact and we don't, we don't stay in touch at all. Yeah. Oh, and, and were you in contact with him all the way up to his death? Uh, not, I actually was, had no contact with him while I was growing up. And then a couple of years before he died, he died in 1981. So in 1979, we got back in touch <clears throat> and there was an attempt to, uh, to, to build some, whatever relationship, but um, once again, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad story, but it's, it's, it's the truth. You can't get around it. My father was an alcoholic um, and he was really, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the depths of his alcoholism at that point. So <clears throat> most of our, our conversations were in the middle of the night um, with him, you know, inebriated and mostly one-sided conversations. So I would say it was very difficult to build any kind of relationship with him. Um, but I, I wrote a book about my father. I spent really, you know, and, and part of this process of getting coming to terms with this, you know, dysfunctional relationship that we had, and um, you know, out of curiosity to learn as much as I could, I, I wrote a book um, that which I will shamelessly plug. Yes, please do. Crazy, crazy, crazy man, crazy. The Bill Haley story, um, which is published um, in the United in, in North America on Backbeat Books. And in the UK with Omnibus, which is also oh, international. But I, I imagine we can pick it up on Amazon, right? Yes, it's available on Amazon. So I kind of I talked about this this uh, this process in the book of of coming to terms with my father um, and his alcoholism and, and our lack of a relationship. But of course, I also told his fascinating story of his career. Um, but but. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm actually now also working on a documentary. So even after all these years of doing research, writing a book, I continue to learn more and more. And mm -hmm. I'm in the process of working on a documentary. And I recently actually obtained um, recorded conversations, telephone conversations that my father had with one, a business associate during this same period, about six to eight hours of conversations, which really even provide even more insight into his personality and, and helped me to to even become more um, em empathetic toward toward him and 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 you know um, what he went through. But yeah. but um, you know to to answer your question to get to your point, never really did have that kind of father son relationship, which certainly I always wanted, but um, I'm sure didn't work out that way. So you you watched his career from afar. Yeah yeah pretty much. Um, and um, how did that feel for you? it was very difficult and strange, you know, and I actually had to, I had to really process a lot of it and, uh, and uh, come to terms with it. So, so truthfully, um, for a lot of my, let's say my adolescent years, my teenage years and into my twenties and even thirties, I, I really rejected my father, you know, and I, and I, I, um, I, I, did not um, participate in any opportunities to talk about him, 
um, I, I just kind of didn't want anything to do with them. And then, and then I got to a point in my life where I just realized, you know, life is short, you know, um, and so I did come to terms with it. But, but, but part of that process was learning as much as I could about his life and understanding it. So I did eventually become a huge fan of his, of his music and his career, very interesting career, but not just him, the entire, uh, that whole uh, musical explosion that happened in the early 50s, mid 50s yeah. and on and on, and, and, yeah. and going back earlier. So, um, so yeah, I'm fortunate enough to have had access to a lot of uh, uh, the people he worked with uh, conducting interviews to write the book. So, all, you know, all, many of the musicians in his bands, um, his, his former wives, um, friends, business associates. So I really learned a lot about him wow. uh, through all those um, interviews and, and wow. research I did, yeah. Well, well, we'll definitely check out the book, but uh, I'd like a kind of a broad brush stroke um, outline a little bit if we could talk about his career in music. But before we do that, I have to tell you how extraordinarily alike you look to him. I I'm sure you've been told that many times. Well, I, I don't see it as much as, as maybe some other people do because, uh, you know, I, I look like, I think equally like my mother too. And I have some of his features and thankfully I have some of his vocal cords. So I've been <laughs> able to, uh, you know, once again, reluctantly, but eventually um, started performing my father's music, which was part of the process of coming to terms as well. Um, traveling around the country and, and actually outside the country a bit. Actually, we did a tour of New Zealand in 2014, which was interesting, but uh, UK, Germany, and, and mostly United States, meeting fans who would uh, talk about the, you know, what he meant to them, what his music meant to them. And that, you know, also helped me to um, become more empathetic and understanding of who he was. But so thankfully I can sing enough like him that I can put on a show and people enjoy it and feel as though they're getting somewhat of the experience. Obviously it's not, you know, his voice. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but we, I mean, but you, we, sorry, yeah. you you came to performing his tunes quite recently, really, didn't you? Um, well, it's been about 12 years now. So I, I guess that's still recent considering I'm 66 years old. Yes, I didn't do it until I was into my 50s, actually. So, um, so yeah, that would be relatively recent. And it was kind of kind of accidental. Uh, you know, I, I've always been musical, but I was always also intimidated by my father's immense fame and 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 um, you know uh, the comparisons, et cetera, et cetera. But I did write songs and 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 performed locally, and and um, and one thing led to another, where I I actually had an opportunity to record a CD of my <clears throat> original tunes, and we did a, a CD release party, and as a favor to the hosts of the party, performed some of my dad's tunes, and somebody pulled out their their mobile phone and and recorded a, a video of us doing Rock Around the Clock very poorly, put it on YouTube, and I got a call from a booking agent who, who called me and said, if I could put together a band that could perform this music, you know, really, uh, you know, professionally, um, he could, he could, you know, find some opportunities for it. So that's what I did. So that was back in 2010 or 11, I think it was. So, so yeah, relatively recently. Yeah. And now it's a very successful act, you and the band Bill Haley Jr. in the Comets. Well, it, it is. Thankfully, yeah, we, we, with the exception of the last couple of years with COVID, we, we worked pretty steadily and, and traveled quite a bit. And now that's all coming back, thankfully, uh, uh, now. So this, the, the second half of this year, we'll, we'll be pretty busy traveling. We'll be doing a, uh, a, uh, a, 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 a cruise in the Caribbean, the Malt Shop Memories Cruise, and, and a lot of one-offs in, in uh, Texas and Indiana, Florida. Nice. Pennsylvania where I live so maybe yeah. you'll come back down this way we'd love to we'd absolutely love to um mm, we we'd like thoroughly to enjoyed you. New Zealand and, and we we were so uh, hoping we, we get a chance to take that short hop over to Australia but didn't, didn't work happen. out then but, right. but hopefully it will sometime yeah, yeah 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 um Bill Haley Jr has the name been a, a, a hindrance or a help to you well personally um, it, it, I think it was a it was a bit of a hindrance to me only because of the unfortunate uh, circumstances. Um, you know, I think every every boy needs a father, and I didn't have a father, and lots of boys don't have fathers. But the fact that my father was so famous, and I have his name, and it was constantly th you know thrown in my face pretty much by people who were curious and well meaning. But it was difficult for me to try to explain why I didn't have a relationship with my father, why he left us, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, you know, the 
the the um, the whole thing about um, wanting to be find some measure of success in life compared to someone who has achieved international fame, it's a daunting test to live in someone's shadow. I mean, it's a subtle difference, but but um, but I wouldn't say it was a blessing by any means. However, you know, it's, everything is what you make of it in life. Um, so I do feel fortunate that I, you know, do have a connection to this famous person. And, um, you know, it was very interesting learning about him as the way I did and having the opportunities um, uh, that, that, that came upon me by writing the book. So, so I would say it was a mixed blessing. Right. Can you share a little bit about what you learned about him? Um, I mean, for instance, what, why did he become so famous? Was it just the time that it was or did he have some unique ingredient that uh, that that made him so famous everywhere i think it, it i will say it's both so you know um so you know the timing was important because um you know the way i view this what you know we call rock and roll and in, in this mu music um, this whole um a phenomena of american music including rhythm and blues jazz country all this stuff really kind of began, in my view, in the 1890s in New Orleans and it evolved. But by the early 1950s, something was happening because of the unique, maybe not so unique, but, but, but very unique kind of um, racial situation in the United States with slavery and then civil rights, but there was still segregation, including in the arts and music and so on and so forth. So, so by the early 50s, um, what, what we now call rhythm and blues music was called race music, and it was predominantly music for, for African Americans. Um, and and um, country music, as we call it now, was called hillbilly and western. So my father was a hillbilly and western artist. But inevitably, these two powerful musical forms were going to merge. And eventually they did with a resounding boom in the mid-1950s with... Yeah. Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry, Little Richard. But my father kind of tapped into that five years before that, say 1949, 1950, he put together a band with the purpose of really trying to get kids dancing again. But the way he did it was to perform um, race music because my father was also a disc jockey. So he was exposed to a lot of this music that most of white America was not exposed to. It was very, you know, niche music and very, you know, only, only, you know, record stores in black neighborhoods would carry the records, et cetera. But because my dad was also an itinerant hillbilly musician, but he, he was exposed to a lot of this music in his travels throughout the South and the West, et cetera. Uh, and, he, and a disc jockey where he could expose, get exposed to the records. He enjoyed, uh, race music once again as it was called and began performing as a hillbilly and western artist in the beginning as a joke but it caught on and um and and it kind of snowballed so you know the timing was was fortuitous for him because it because it was about to happen but he was also um deserves credit for recognizing the possibilities and also um having the courage to perform black music as a white artist in 1950 and 51 and 52 when it was not only frowned upon but it was it was actually quite dangerous and, yeah. and, and even in the mid 50s when he toured he endured uh, you know bomb scares death threats etc cetera, etc cetera. a lot of a lot of abuse from the, from the press from the media from from you know the racists in society so he deserves credit for recognizing it and and working it and um and developing it and then you know creating hit records from it um, before any of the other pioneers of rock and roll did. But but once again, 10 years earlier or 10 years later, it, it wouldn't... It would know, have been a different story. Been, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Rock Around the Clock was his first hit, wasn't it, in 1954? Not his first hit, no. That, his first hit, um, his first, well, regional hits were, um, I, I would say, a song called... Um, Rock the Joint, which was a, a kind of a local, you know, rhythm and blues or race record, um, but it became a nice local hit for him in, in 1951. Um, and Rocket 88, another a hit, a song that was a hit in the race markets um, by Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm, who were a part of the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, by Jackie Branston, who was a part of Ike Turner's band. So they did a cover version of that in 1951. And then in 1953, my dad wrote a song 
called Crazy Man Crazy about, you know, kids dancing and having a good time. And that actually um, broke onto the national charts and hit reached number 11, in cash box number 12 on billboard. Oh. And it really kind of, this was a time when the hit record, the, the number one record was um, um, song from the Moulin Rouge by Percy Faith and his orchestra. And how much is that doggy in the window? You know, this, <laughs> these Tin Pan Alley things. And he had a national hit with this record he wrote called Crazy Man Crazy. Um, so that so that was really the, the, the first hit that he had. And the success of that record caught the attention of some of the major record labels, including Decca Records, which signed him. And then in April of 1954, he recorded the song Rock Around the Clock on the B side of a record. The, the, the first recording session, the hit was supposed to be a song called 13 Women and Only One Man in Town. And they, and they, went, they went up to Decca Records in New York in the Pythian Temple and they spent all day recording this song that was going to be a hit. They had 45 minutes left in the session. So as part of the deal for getting the record deal, um, they were allowed to put whatever they wanted on the B-side. So they, they put this song that they've been working with called We're Gonna Rock Around the Clock on the B-side. The record was released and it actually did chart 13 women um, for like a week. It was like number 26 and then kind of disappeared. They went back in the studio a month later and recorded another rhythm and blues tune called Shake, Rattle and Roll, which was a hit for Big Joe Turner. That was a multi-million selling record. And that was really kind of what the song, the hit that put him on the map and his band, The Comets. Um, and they, they had a, a few more hits. And then uh, as fate would have it, and I won't go into too much detail because all these could be long stories, but I'll try to be very brief. No, we'll have um, to buy the book. Yeah, yeah, it's in the book for sure. But so so there was a movie being made called The Blackboard Jungle about juvenile delinquency. And the star of the movie, Glenn Ford, and the director, um, uh, Richard Brooks, um, would get together at, at, at Glenn Ford's home. And in one of these times, uh, you know, to go over the script, and at one of these times, um, Richard Brooks said to Glenn Ford, we're gonna need a song put on the soundtrack of this movie. And it's gonna be a very controversial, shocking movie. And Glenn Ford said, well, my son, Peter, 12 year old son, Peter is into, you know, current music. Let's go check out his record collection. <laughs> and right on top was Rock Around the Clock. Yeah. So Richard Brooks took that record back to the, uh, the studio, played it for some of the other execs, and they all agreed it would be a perfect fit for the movie. So, you know, a year after it was recorded, it came out on the soundtrack in March of 1955 of, of uh, The Blackbird Jungle. And uh, then it, it just exploded. By July, it became the first number one rock and roll record, even though they still didn't call it rock and roll yet. Um, the label, they, they called it a foxtrot with vocal chorus. That's <laughs> really? how they described the record. Really? But that, that really was the demarcation point where rock and roll became um, a force. And then, you know, shortly after that, within six months, Elvis Presley came on the scene. And then the next couple of years, Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry and on and on and on, and Gene Vincent and Buddy Holly. Um, but but Rock Around the Clock was really the record that um, kicked it up that, that announced rock and roll was here. Yeah, yeah, he was really the forerunner of it all. He was, he was, and you know, um, unfortunately for him, he was eclipsed um, by Elvis Presley. So he was originally, I mean, from 1954, 1955, the first half of 1956, he was considered the king of rock and roll. Uh, and even Elvis, when they when they met in late 55, and Elvis uh, was added to my father's tour as a, as a favor. Um, Colonel Parker, and there's a great Elvis movie. I think it's going to be great coming out. Oh, it's uh, sensational, Bill. I've seen it yeah. already. It's just brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well, we I've heard we that need show. one on your dad. Well, there almost was with the book, but COVID put the damper on that. We, we had a, a producer who bought the rights and was, was working on it, and then COVID hit, and he had to... You know, he couldn't, you know, renew the the time period he had oh, to make. It may come back now, though. It, it may come back now. But 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 uh, but even when when Elvis uh, met my father, uh, he was added to the tour as a favor to, to Colonel Parker. Um, he told my dad that Crazy Man Crazy in 1953 was the song while he was driving a truck in Tennessee that that inspired him to want to become a professional musician. And 
and he, you know, of course, admired my father, and they became friends. Um, so, so, so my father was the king of rock and roll. But then, of course, Elvis was, as you know, just a force that we may never see again. And Elvis became the king of rock and roll. And so my father was kind of pushed aside. And of course, younger, more dynamic artists flooded the, the, the airwaves. And so um, in, in despite his immense success for a year and a half to two years, he, he was quickly pretty much overlooked and forgotten. And he's right. dismissed by a lot of the historians. But, but he continued to be very popular around the rest of the world, including Australia, where in January 57, he did a tour that broke all kinds of records and filled stadiums and um, oh. was, was, was so successful that legend has it in a, uh, that, that Frank Sinatra was supposed to follow him for a tour, but he got to Hawaii and heard about the immense success of the tour and said, you know what, I can't follow that. And he backed out of that tour. I'm oh, sure yeah. he toured later successfully. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how amazing. And um, Bill, is it true that, that he was, I'll go again. Bill, was it true that he was blind in one eye? Yes, yeah. Um, so when he was four years old, he had uh, what, what was a, a, a mastoid, they call it, some kind of growth behind his, his left ear. And uh, you know, back in those days, this was in 1929, um, the doctor came to your house and did the surgery on the kitchen table. And it was kind of a crude operation and severed his optic nerve in his, in his, in his left eye. Yeah. And um, um, his parents, it took a couple of years for them to realize he was blind because he was only four years old. Um, but he had kind of a wandering eye and and um, as a way of kind of um, drawing, drawing attention away from the eye, one of the one of the ways he decided to do it was to become a singing cowboy and wear a cowboy hat. Um, so that somewhat inspired him. And then, of course, um, when his group, the Saddlemen, was, as I mentioned, they were a hillbilly and Western band. But by 1950, late 52, early 53, they were changing their sound. They had added a saxophone player and drummer and you know, a jazz guitarist. Um, so they had to get rid of the cowboy hats and boots. So at that point, my father decided to take the, the, the cowlick and turn it into a curl, the spit curl. Once again, as a diversion from his blind, his, his wandering left eye, because he was very self-conscious about that. Um, but he, but you know, people wouldn't know, of course, unless you looked at his eye that looked a little funny that he was blind. He never, you know, it, didn't really hinder him from driving or doing, you know, performing or doing anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in public, yeah. So. I, I can imagine that those times when Elvis came about and, and, and totally took over as king of rock and roll, that would have contributed to the drinking problem, wouldn't it? He wouldn't feel too good about yeah. himself. I, well, you know, yeah, curiously, my father really was not much of a drinker prior to, um, um, you know, becoming famous. Um, so, to your point, yes, when, when Elvis Elvis really became um, the 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 uh, you know the king of rock and roll in mid '56. However, the Comets did a usually successful tour in January '57 of Australia, followed by an equally successful tour of the UK in February and March of '57. A tour where um, a whole slew of 14 and 15 year old boys saw him who were inspired to become rock and roll stars themselves. People like Paul McCartney and Graham Nash and Pete Townsend and uh, on and on and on. Following that tour, coming back to the United States and really kind of facing the music that it was kind of over here, that's when he started drinking um, um, heavily. Um, I mean, he, had, he was a social drinker prior to that, but that's when the, the drinking really started. And over a period of, of the next four, five years, um, everything started to unravel in terms of his business empire. So, he, so, you know, he and his business partners, two of his band members and his manager were the four partners in the corporation. They had built a rec recording studio. They had a stable of artists that they were trying to promote. Um, they were, you know, they were trying many, many things, but all of that fell apart and failed over a period of five years, say, after the UK tour. And during that period, the drinking grew and grew and grew and grew to the point where it reached a point of no return. And he remained an alcoholic the rest of his life, which contributed to his early death uh, at the age of 55 in 1981. Uh, I was going to ask you, did he die of alcohol-related disease? 
Yeah, well, officially, it, it, the, birth, the death certificate says a heart attack. But um, as I mentioned, not only was he a heavy drinker, he was a heavy smoker. Um, so I think those were the two contributing factors. And then if there's a psychological component to it, uh, my father was a very um, troubled man at the end of his life. And I mentioned there were many late night conversations. Um, many of those conversations were about his, his um, distress over his failing marriage to his third wife. Um, and by the time he died, his third wife had basically um, thrown him out of the house. I, I, I a better way to put that. I mean, he was living in a pool house behind his house, but but he was estranged. And and I, I go into all this in the book, but actually the day before he died, um, he called me and I'm sure he called other people as well, but, but was very, very troubled. He um, was basically, you know, pleading with me to call his ex-wife or his current wife, I'm sorry, to, take um, him back. Martha, third, or to get him back. And, and, you know, of course, I couldn't help out with that. Uh, and the next day he died. So um, I think all, I think his, his poor health due to drinking, smoking, and also his mental state was, was um, deteriorating heavily, but still mm -hmm. at the age of 55. And of course, I was only, I was in my mid twenties at the point. And, you know, I thought, well, 55, that's a pretty long life. Now I realize at the age of 66, my God, he was a young man. Absolutely. Uh, but, oh, but, what a, yeah, that, what an oh, awful yeah, story. Up. Certainly yeah. paints him in a whole different life. What, how interesting. What, yeah. what a tragedy, really. Um, yeah. Bill, Bill Haley Jr., which is there? Is there one song of your dad's that's your absolute favorite? Well, I, I wouldn't say one song, but I, but I'm very partial to. Um, there was a period um, from say 1951 to you know up until the early decade years of 54 and 55, where the, I just thought they were very very creative. They were kind of straddling two worlds. They were still a hillbilly western country band, and on the flip side, they were doing these race record covers, or, or finally write their own tunes. And uh, they were all just phenomenal tunes. You know, some were hits, some were minor hits and whatnot. But those those are all my favorite records. So you know, Crazy Man, Crazy, and all that, of course. But um, um, you know, songs like a "Dance with the Dolly" with a hole in her stocking and "Green Tree Boogie" and "Sundown Boogie." Those are the songs I really love. And and um, you know, in our in our act, um, we 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 tell these stories. We tell you know not so much the personal stories, but we tell the stories of his musical career. His 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 evolution, his transition. And we, we show uh, a PowerPoint, a presentation of photographs in the background. So I kind of tell these stories, but we do some of those early tunes. Now, obviously the audience wants to hear the tunes that are more familiar with the Decca hits, um, but we do a number of those early um, recordings that were done on a, a local Philadelphia label called Essex. They are my favorites, so I can't pick right. just one, but, but that, that period. Well, that's time. good. I, well, we can certainly have a listen to a couple of those now. And of the more well-known ones, um, do you do them all in your act? We do. We do. Certainly all, you know, and he didn't have that many major, I mean, he had maybe uh, 20, 20 hits, you would say, but but they weren't all major hits. Obviously, Rock Around the Clock was the biggest one. Shake, Rattle and Roll, See You Later, Alligator. Um, but there were hits like Dim, Dim the Lights and um, Razzle Dazzle, um, uh, you know, Rudy's Rock. I mean, you know, they were all hits and we, we, we do all of those. Sure. Oh, how yeah. awesome. And they're still played at parties today. They're still on the radio. They're still the tunes that people get up and dance to. How do you explain that they're still popular 60 something years later? Yeah, that is amazing. That that really is amazing. Um, but but you know, I think the reason is so. You know, just backtracking a little bit. You know, I mentioned that that you know my father was a hillbilly and western artist, but with his we got together with some musical partners, and they had ambition and a goal to become rich and famous. And the way they were going to do that was to get kids dancing again. Right. So they developed this. I mean, through trial and error, and they would listen to records and try to. I mean, the whole point was to try to come up with songs that were uh, short, sweet, upbeat, happy, get people dancing. And those very qualities are what, why they're still enduring, I think, because they just make you happy. They make you want to tap your feet. They make you want to get up and dance. That's, that's the, you know, I mean, I don't think their intention was to write songs that what people would listen to 75 years from now, but the, but the formula they came up with to sell records and to have hits um, is the same reason why people still listen to them. 
they were yeah. successful in that regard. Yeah. yeah, amazing, amazing. People still like to dance to the same stuff, don't they? Yeah. If it makes you move, it makes you move. And uh, yeah. those are the songs that definitely still make us move in 2022. Yeah, and, and we'll continue to do so for generations to come. doesn't matter how old you are or, or probably when you're born into the future. What an incredible story. I really yeah. love to see your band. It's called Bill Haley Jr. and the Comets. Yes. And uh, you're performing, well, you've got tours booked uh, right around the US. We'll just keep mm -hmm. our fingers crossed that someone brings you here or that you put together a, a musical or you said you're in the middle of that documentary. Right. And that uh, a movie comes out would be great to uh, yep. to learn yep. lots more from you, Bill. Yeah, yeah, that's what we hope. All those things, sure, sure. <laughs> um, awesome. You know, I, I, you know, occasionally I get to go to the UK, and of course, COVID COVID put put a damper on that. So, you know, here in the US, um, the audience for this music is you know primarily people who were teenagers in the fifties who are now in their eighties and nineties. Um, and then, um, I, and, and this probably happened in, in Australia as well, but in the early 70s, there was a kind of a, a, a rekindling of interest, a rock and roll revival period. And there was the uh, American Graffiti, the movie, um, and the television series, Happy Days, 50s. And Rock Around the Clock was used on both of those as well. So there's a whole another generation, yeah. who people who are now in their 50s and 60s, who also come to our shows in the US. Yeah. In the UK, there was a, and I don't know if this happened in Australia, but but there was in the early '80s there was kind of a, um, a, a, a revival of interest in this music as well. Not just my father, but you know all the, the pioneers. Yeah. So so those people are now in their you know '40s '50s. So there's kind of a younger following in the UK than in the United States when I go there. But you know, once again, it's not a huge following, but it's very strong, very rabid fans who really love the music. You know, the, not just the music, the culture that goes along with it, the, the right. dance and so on and so forth. And if you're out there bringing it to the masses, uh, that following will continue to grow. You, well, you're well, putting not. it back in their faces or in and their feet. Yes. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Sure. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Bill Haley Jr., thank you so much for sharing your stories and your time with us. What a, what a pleasure talking with you. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to seeing you here. See if we can't get you guys out here. It'd be great. Love to get up and have a dance to that music again. That would be great. I'd, uh, if, if I do get over there, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, you know, buy you a, a beverage and, and chat Sounds some good. more. Good. We're doing Terrific. it. Terrific. Talk to you again soon. All the very, All right. very best. Thanks a million for, for talking with me. Thank you again. Bye, Bill. Bye-bye.